I have My dad told me one time about a football player. Right. A football team protected, predicted to win, but they suffered an embarrassing loss. And when the key player was questioned and interviewed and asked, why did you lose? He, he said that we had lost in the locker room. Yeah. It wasn't that they had better players. It wasn't because they had better coaches. It wasn't because they had a better game plan. It was, wasn't was who had home field advantage. It, it, it wasn't who Vegas predicted to win. It wasn't about any of that. No, he said we lost in the locker room before the game even began. He was speaking about the disunity and discord that affected the team and he suggested that before they put the uniforms on and before they stepped out on the field before they even saw their opponents before the corn was tossed and the ball was kicked they had already lost because they lost in the locker room you listen to this preacher tonight you can lose in the locker room that's not just in the game of football, but that's in the game of life. You can be defeated before the game even begins. And I'm just going to be real honest with you early on. How you come out of the battle is typically determined on how you win in it. The success in the struggle usually depends upon what you did before the struggle began. Your deliverance from a storm can be determined on how you go into the storm. The outcome of the interview is usually set before the interview. The result of the test can be determined before the first question is even asked. That what you bring to the battlefield will determine what happens on the battlefield and how you look coming out of the battlefield. How you begin and how you go in will determine how you come out. Now, the brother said I was going to preach something that you might have already heard before. I'm sure nobody in this building has ever heard the story of David and Goliath. It's a rare story hidden in text that nobody's ever spoken about, but tonight I'm going to attempt to preach the story. It'll be something brand spanking new. Nobody knows about Goliath. I don't even think David was a significant figure. I just stumbled upon it this week, so. So I'm gonna help you. David versus Goliath and the Israelites are going to war with their dreaded enemy, the Philistines. They're on opposite sides of the Valley of Elah. The Philistines sent out their war, their war, Goliath, from Gath. Goliath is six cubits and a span. Scholars debate on how actually tall he is, but before, but Here's what we do know. He big. And he's battle tested. He's tall. And has the testimony of terror. Thousands. Have fallen. At the sword. Of Goliath. Goliath then comes down to the valley of Elah. The same time every day looks up against the armies of Israel and challenges them to send one man who could stand against him. Can I just take a...
aside from my notes from just a moment and tell you the effectiveness of what one man can do to a society. Can I tell you tonight that if just one man would get on fire, if one man would just get a little preaching him, if one man decided to be sanctified, if just one man decided to go tell the neighbor, just one, it doesn't, listen, we think it takes a crowd. It don't take a crowd, it takes one man. Can I tell you that is why there is a war against men in this society? They want to feminize us. They want to strip away our masculinity. And they want to tell us that our masculinity is toxic. Can I tell you your masculinity was sent by God to be a warrior, to be a general, to be a high priest of your home? There has been a war against the man. But I'm just hearing my spirit. I'm about to send a revival to the men. You want your church to change? You want your community to change? Let the men catch on fire. Let the men step up to the rightful place of being the high priest of their home. We teach them how to throw a football. And we teach them how to throw a baseball. And we yell at them when they don't hold the flashlight right. But we don't teach them how to pray. We don't teach them how to read the Bible. We don't teach them how to get in the secret place of God. And if you don't raise up a man according to the way he should go, he will depart from the path. It just takes one man. Men have been sitting down and quiet too long. Goliath makes an ultimatum. He says, you beat me, I'm your servant. But if I beat you, you my servant. And it's sad to say, not one man. That's what it says. Not one creature from the camp of Israel. No one wanted to fight him. No one wanted to stand against someone who was six cubits tall. That was battle tested. That had that kind of reputation. Until there was a boy. Can I tell you? If a man won't step up, he'll raise up a boy. Not one man stood up. It took a boy to say, I'm going to believe God. And I don't know if you know this, but this is a spoiler alert. David won. I don't... I don't know if anybody saw that coming because he was a boy and he was a giant. And I'm sorry if you haven't read the book already. But it's in there, I promise. Scholars are baffled on how a rock can take out Goliath. And how a little pebble that fits inside of a slingshot can take a man who's killed thousands. 
Can I suggest to you tonight that the reason scholars are baffled because they failed to understand what David had was more than an arsenal of five rocks and a slingshot. Listen to this preacher tonight. It's not the rocks he found in the valley that won him the victory. But it was some stuff he took with him to the valley that caused him to win against Goliath. Don't miss this. It wasn't what he found when the battle begun, but it was his spirit he brought with him to the battlefield. It was his attitude and the mindset that was within him that brought him the victory before he even stepped foot on the battlefield. Can I tell you tonight, it's not what's in your hand that will determine what this battle will look like, but it's what's in your heart. Can I speak to the men for just one more second? It's in men's heart. Lust. Pride. Listen, I knew it was going to get real quiet on that one. But you, you amen me enough to have an amen already in my spirit. And what God is looking for is some sanctified, Holy Ghost filled men. To break the generational curses of lust and abandonment and learn how to be a father and a high priest in their home. It is what's in your heart. You must have the right heart, the right attitude. You must have the right spirit in your next season, in your next battle, in your next storm. You must have the right stuff. And I can tell you, if you have the right stuff, you can take down some giants. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. When you read the text, he has four conversations. Come on. In 26, he speaks to the soldiers. In 29, he speaks with his brother Eliab. In 32, he speaks with King Saul. And in 35, he speaks to Goliath. In those four conversations, we discover the weapons that David took with him. And I would suggest that before you go into your next battle, you take some notes tonight. So you can win. Come on. When he shows up in the valley, the soldiers are talking about how big and how bad Goliath is. They are talking about how skilled he is, how powerful his weapons look. They're talking about Goliath, and they are afraid of fighting him. The Bible says that while David was down there, Goliath makes his challenge. While the soldiers were talking about, talking about how bad Goliath is, David says something very unique. They're afraid and talking about how bad it is. But David asked a question. What shall be given to the man who kills him? What distinguished the boy David from the other men of Israel is my first weapon. David had a vision of victory. He had a vision of victory that the others in his life did not have. And when others forecasted failure, when others predicted defeat, when others saw an obstacle that he could not overcome, David looked at the same thing and saw himself victorious on the other side. David did not wonder about the battle. He was wondering about the reward when he came out of the battle victorious. Because David already saw victory. David already claimed victory. I already believe it's going to work in my favor. The battle ain't the problem. I want to know the reward. And in order to find
fight the challenges of life, you have to have a vision of victory. The first thing you realize to have a vision of victory is that Goliath and this battle is not something I'm going to. But it's something I'm going through. You see, there's a difference in a mindset. That I'm going to something versus I'm going through something. When I think about we're going to it, we can tend to believe that's our final destination. That it's the end of the road. That it's the last chapter, but in your mind, no matter what the battle is, you tell yourself, this is just something I'm going through. Then you already begin to see yourself on the other side of whatever it is that's about to challenge you in life. Listen to this preacher tonight. I came to this pulpit under the anointing of the Holy Ghost to tell somebody, you will get through this. You will make it through. This won't last forever because we serve a God that specializes on us. Mm. We don't talk about the valley of the shadow of death. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't talk. We don't walk to the fire. We walk through the fire. We walk through hard times. We work through tough situations. We live through rough seasons in our life. But if you trust in God, we serve a God that will bring you out of whatever you found yourself in. He brought Moses out of the Red Sea. He brought the children of Israel out of the wilderness. He brought Daniel out of the lion's den. He brought the three Hebrew boys out of the fire. He brought Peter out of prison. He brought Paul out of the storm. He brought Lazarus out of the grave. He brought Jesus out of death. Is there someone here today that is a witness that he brought me out to? And the same God that brought me out back then, it's the same God that's going to bring... He's the same God. I don't want to serve no new God. I want to serve the same God. I don't want to serve any new religions. I want to serve the same God. Somebody's about to get delivered tonight. I feel somebody about to get delivered tonight. You want to carry some stuff, but you are about to leave free. The devil's fixed you. Sit down, I gotta get through this. This is something I'm about to go through. And on the other side, I see myself wiser. On the other side, I see myself happier. On the other side, I see myself better. Because you see, I have a vision of victory. In verse 28, he begins to speak to his brother Eliab. Eliab is negative. He literally maligns David's intentions. 
He mocks David's efforts. He ridicules David. He belittles David's vision. He disrespects David's assignment. Because you see, whenever God has given you a vision, the devil will always send somebody to discourage you. Because vision and discouragement, they go hand in hand. There's always someone who wants to tell you what you can't do. Always someone who will tell you your motivation isn't right. Or that your plan won't succeed. And ain't it crazy that he just uses folk the closest to you? Notice that when Eliab begins to speak, that this is the shortest conversation David has. He doesn't try to persuade Eliab. He doesn't try to explain Eliab himself to Eliab. He doesn't try to defend his vision to Eliab. He doesn't try to convince Eliab to support him. David understands that when you're about to go into battle, your second weapon needs to be, you've got to be selective on who speaks to your spirit. You can't listen to everybody. You can't take advice from everybody. You can't deal with everybody's issues. You can't be persuaded by everybody's opinion. Listen to this preacher tonight because there are some people who are not qualified to speak into your life and to speak into your spirit when you're about to go into the greatest challenge of your life. There are some folk you just got to ignore. There's just some folk you just got to walk away from. Some folk you just got to shut your ears to because they ain't there to help you. David says to his brother, what have I done now? The word now lets you know that David knows who he's dealing with. Because if you come up to me complaining about something in the church and I say, what's wrong with you now? That's just my subtle way of telling you that you complain too much. That you always got something negative to say. You're always upset about something. When someone says the word now, that means that they know you. And this is more of the same thing that you always do. David says, what have I done now? Suggests Eliab has always had a problem with David. I'm going to take a brief, I want to give you quick, three quick things that disqualified Eliab. Number one, he was envious of David. And Eliab is upset that the favor of God had not rested on him, but the favor of God had rested on David. And never underestimate how far jealous folk will go to try to discourage you when they know God has favored you. Eliab was intimidated by David because David has a vision of doing what Eliab was scared of. You've got to be careful because your vision intimidates them. Because you're trying to do what they quit doing years ago. You have the audacity to believe that you can take it somewhere they never dreamed they could. And they will discourage you because they don't want your resume to outshine theirs.
Eliab is ignorant of David's assignment. He accuses David of leaving the household duties, but earlier in the chapter, David's dad, Jesse, tells David to come to the battlefield. Now listen to this preacher tonight. You don't understand what my father told me to do. And so now you're discouraging me because you're ignorant of what daddy told me to do. And you have to be careful of folk who have no discernment of what your father has commanded you to do. Because they will try to discourage you from doing what God has called you to do. Because they have no idea what God has called you to do. And there are some people... You have to be selective on who speaks to your spirit. David has a vision of victory. Amen? David is selective of who speaks to his spirit. And after his conversations with the soldiers and with his brother, He speaks to Saul. And Saul says, you can't fight Goliath. You are a child. And Goliath has been fighting since he was a child. David is about 17 in this story. Goliath has been fighting longer than David's been alive. He's killed thousands. Goliath has never lost a battle. Goliath has always been in the valley and always came out victorious. No one has beaten Goliath. And therefore, you won't either. You see, if the enemy can't discourage you, he'll try to scare you. He will remind you of how Goliath has been victorious over others. He will run the list of everyone who's tried to defeat him and lost. Of everyone who is diagnosed and died. Of everyone who gave it their best and came up short. Of everyone who wanted to but couldn't. Of ones who dreamed but never saw it come to reality. He will run the list of how Goliath has defeated others who has stood in your same shoes with the same vision to try to scare you to think that the experience of others sets limitations on you. The enemy will try to convince you that the experience of others ultimately set limitations on you. David says... When you walk with God and you have undeniable evidence that God is in your life, you will never allow yourself to be limited by somebody else's past failures. When you got evidence that God is working in your life, you will not limit God by what others could not do. When you got the evidence that God has been working in your life, You just believe the same God who started it back then is the same God that's going to be able to get you through it right now. This conversation makes you think that you can beat Goliath. But David says, I can beat Goliath because of his third weapon. His third weapon was, I can beat Goliath because I'm anointed. Listen, he says, I'm not supposed to be here because one day a lion showed up and grabbed him and I grabbed him by the beard. The next day a bear showed up and because I beat the lion, I was just stupid enough to hit that bear. And I just figured that if the God that brought me through the lion and the God that brought me through the bear, then the same God. And the same God that kept me from the bear is the same God that will keep me against Goliath. David says I can beat this thing 
because I'm anointed. Now listen to this Pentecostal preacher. Anointing does not mean you speak in tongues. Anointing does not mean you lay hands on folk and they fall out. Anointing does not mean that you can prophesy and speak things into people's lives. No, 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 no. What the anointing means is that you have physical evidence that the Spirit of God is resting on your life. You got evidence that the Lord's hand must be on your life. You got evidence that the Lord is working in your life. That evidence is not the Bible you carry. It's not the scriptures you quote. It's not the church you go to. But there are some people who can look back on the hell they've been through and declare that the only reason I came out is because the hand of God must have been on my life. And therefore I know I'm anointed. After all the hell I've been through, I must be anointed. After all the struggles I've survived, I must be anointed. After all the surgeries I've come through, I must be anointed. After the diagnosis I've dealt with, I must be anointed. And because I'm anointed, I can claim victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. You know, what I'm tired of is the devil beating us up. We walk in the church and the pastor has to give an announcement about testimony service about not to dump on me. And I get it because life be hard sometimes. But can I tell you? That when you know that God has put his hand on your life, I ain't got to try to argue with nobody. I ain't got to convince nobody. I ain't trying to get you on my team. I'm not trying to get you on my side. I ain't got to explain it to you. I just let my anointing speak for me. You can say what you want to say about this preacher. But I know the hand of God is on my life. They can say whatever they want to say about you. But they ain't ever been through what you've been through. That's why they don't understand your praise. That's why they don't understand your worship. It's because they ain't ever been through the hell that you've been through. They've never been addicted the way you've been addicted. They never had to fight for their life uh, the way you fought for your life. Uh, they never had to pray for their spouse uh, like you pray for. Listen, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, Lazarus does not preach a sermon. He doesn't write a book. Actually, the next time we hear about Lazarus is he's just sitting next to Jesus at a party. Lazarus was just someplace he shouldn't have been. And his testimony was sitting at tables and people walking in going, I thought you was dead. I, I, I thought they buried you. I went to your funeral. How are you sitting in the house? Because I'm anointed. How are you sitting at the table? Because I'm anointed. How are you still coming after 23 trying to kill you? Because I'm anointed. And when I go into 2024, 
I'm gonna bring all of this anointing with me. I love, listen, I love haters. You can say what you want about me. Listen, I ain't even going to correct you. Listen, I, I, listen, I have people in my own church sometimes talk bad about me. I don't correct them. Because you can say whatever you want to say about me. Hand of God's on my life. And when the hand of God is on your life, it won't matter what other people say about you. Because you know what God has said about you. And when I know what God has said about me, when a lion comes, I can grab it. And when a bear comes, I can grab it. And then when something giant comes, like trying to take my life I can say because I was dumb enough to hit a lion. And I was dumb enough to hit a bear. I'm just going to be dumb enough to believe that I'm going to work them. Snatch you and weave. You see, if the men would get a fight in them, it's uh, hmm. hey, listen. In my early twenties, if you bumped into me at the bar, we going we gonna have a fight. I mean, it was just you know what I mean. And I'm not even that way by nature. But the alcohol made me sweet, man. There was one time I was going after this gentleman that was shorter than me. And I was going to grab him by his beard. And I was going to hit him. And somebody caught me, a buddy of mine, and said, you don't want to do that. He's an MMA fighter. And he undefeated. And I said, it's a good thing I didn't grab him then. Because that would be embarrassing. But you see, there was a fight in me because God put that fight in men and we have been using it to fight against one another. We've been using it to fight against black and white, against vaccinated and unvaccinated, against Republican and Democrat. But can I tell you, I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And when I understand that my when I understand that my warfare isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities. And when I understand that the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in Christ. Did when my family start acting crazy, I just let them be crazy, and I go to my war closet and I begin to say, Jesus, you gotta get. Them. If the men would stand up and pray, if the men would stand up and testify, if the men who used to fight in the world would learn how to fight in the spirit, because God has anointed a breaker. My goodness. The last thing David brings into the battle that Goliath didn't see is that you have to go in the power of prayer. Saul tries to put his armor on David. 
David asked, why are you putting this on me? And here is the answer. That's what Goliath has. And if you're going to try to fight Goliath, shouldn't you try to look like Goliath? Listen, I, I got a new stage design, and it's beautiful. I got two big screen TVs like y'all have and the nice media. I don't have a media person. Listen, I'm just looking around the house to see who I can take back to Abilene with me. I'm, the, I'm my own media person. I'm a little progressive in my way of thinking of church. I'm not as old school as I appear to be sometimes. It's still in me. <clears throat> but none of that matters if we ain't got the Holy Ghost. And the problem is, is that the church has seen what has attracted the young folk. And they're going, if the world is doing this for the young folk, then I have to adapt that to do that for the young folk. Now listen, I believe in doing everything with excellence. I believe your church should be clean. I believe the bathroom should be nice. I believe that you should try to do everything you can make your facility nice but the moment i start trying to look like the world is the moment come on come on is the moment i try to put on what goliath has on to defeat goliath come on david takes off and says your armor is not tested by me i have not tried this before this ain't what i had on when i beat the lion And this ain't what I had on when I brought me out of the bear. Now, this may work for you. But I'm not going to let the size of the battle change the strategy of success. David says, I'm going to do to Goliath what I did to the lion. And I'm going to do to Goliath what I did to that bear. Paul says, listen, if you don't go down there with a sword, if you don't go down there with a shield, if you don't go down there with a helmet, what are you going down there with? Now he's just a shepherd boy. It's probably hot. He's probably wearing some dress looking thing. I don't know if they had pants then. What are you going to wear down there? David answers. I'm going to go and call upon the name of the Lord. And when David gets to the battlefield, Goliath laughs. Goliath laughs because David has no armor. Goliath laughs because all he sees is a rock and a slingshot. What Goliath does not know is that David has something much more powerful on him. David tells Goliath, you come to me with sword and spear, but I stand here in the name of the living God of Israel. And I'm going to call on his name and he will deliver me. What David says is I'm going to be putting this battle in God's hands. He said, you done messed up and let me pray. You should have killed me before I knelt down on my knees. You should have ended this thing before I could lift up the name of my God. But now that I put it in God's hands, the Lord will fight my battle. The Lord will handle the situation. Is there anybody in here? That knows about the power of putting it in God's hands. Now listen, I'm about to go to my seat. But scholars are a little baffled at this.
and with scientific eyes, they wondered the validity of the story. Because how can a rock kill Goliath? So they did the science. They say that with a rock the size of a baseball. That with a sling, the fastest it could have been released is with a trajectory of 90 miles per hour. That is, if you take a projectile going 90 miles an hour, they say if you take the projectile going 90 miles an hour, use Newton's law, second law of motion, and take in fact the coefficient of restitution, that a projectile the size of a baseball going 90 miles an hour would generate about 3,000 pounds of force as it was released. That's if it was traveling the distance of a pitcher to home plate, which is about 60 feet. But we know Goliath was at least twice that far. Then one must also take in effect the drag of the distance of the ball that is working against the velocity and force. Therefore, since he's farther away, the force generated at 3,000 pounds has now reduced itself to arguably 1,000 pounds. But that is if David was throwing straight. The problem is, is that Goliath was taller than David. Which means the angle at which he had launched has to be at least 45 degrees. Which means now the ball is working against gravity, which also reduced the force from the, which the ball has been released. What was 3,000 pounds of force has now been arguably reduced to 500 pounds of force. Oh man, but you've got to remember, Goliath had an armor bearer. Who stands in front of Goliath? Who would have lifted up his shield to take the projectile off course and have reduced the force to at least 50 pounds and taken it off the direction headed towards Goliath's head? But if David could throw it, if David could work against the drag, and if he did counter the weight, and he did go against the coefficient of restitution, and it was knocked off course, and still aimed at Goliath's head. Yeah. Goliath was wearing a helmet. <laughs> and a projectile that started with 3,000 pounds of force ended at 50, hitting a bronze helmet would not have been enough to kill Goliath. How can a young boy with one rock working against gravity, against the coefficient of restitution, working against drag, being deflected by an armor bearer, hitting the bronze helmet, how could that have killed a giant? Because he put it in God's hands. Hey! He put it in God's hands. And if you put it in God's hands, it has supernatural power. If you put it in God's hands, it will work against every force. If you put it in God's hands, it will always hit the target. Is there anybody in here willing to put it in God's hand?
Come on. Come on. There have been some of you that have been trying to be doing it your way. You are exhausted from the battle. You have been beat up, pushed aside, ignored, and overlooked. But I hear the voice of the Lord saying tonight, if you'll put it in God's hands, I don't care about the diagnosis. I don't care about the divorce. I don't care about the kids being on drugs. I don't care about your spouse being crazy. If you learn how to put this battle in God's hands, then your prayer will always hit the mark. And there's some of you in here that need to leave tonight with that in their spirit that God is working, that God is moving. Is there anybody in here that says, I'm going to put it in God's hands? Stand to your feet. Lift your hands to the sky.